For the most, you know, the world in which we live in is not at all conducive to waiting. We don't like to wait for things. You know, we want them right now. This instant syndrome has created barrenness in people's lives and churches. You know, God said this in his word in Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 18. He said, And therefore will the Lord wait, that he may be gracious unto you. And therefore will he be exalted, that he might have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment, and blessed are all they that wait for him. Now, why will we be blessed if we wait for God? Why would God want to make us wait? Why on earth is it necessary? You know, Satan has worked overtime. It's one of his plans. He works overtime in keeping us busy with things that don't matter. And the thing is, we really don't realize that he is doing this. You know, we fill our lives with clutter. Things that really don't matter. Things that don't add to our lives or add to anyone else's lives. It's just clutter within our lives. And this is a ploy of the enemy. You know, the average pastor, and I have pastored for many, many years, and I know the average pastor fills his time with preaching, with administrating, with fundraising, but has very little time, quality time, to wait on God. See what I mean? Hello? Yes? Well, actually, we're in the middle of Philomene at the moment. Okay. You know, there is a saying, when all else fails, read the manual. You know, God has a very, very good reason for telling us to wait and requiring for us to wait. We're going to look at that in some depth today so that we have a better understanding as to why God requires this of us. You know, the Bible says, Psalm 62, 5, My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. And again, we have in Isaiah 40 and verse 31, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. You know, waiting is hard because it's contrary to our lifestyle. We don't really find it easy to do. There's always something else we could be doing or in our own mind we should be doing. But God says, the manual says, that if you wait, he will be gracious unto you. That's, that's the promise of God. And in this process of waiting, it is a constantly giving of ourselves to God, constantly surrendering ourselves to God. You know, the test is, will you keep waiting on God until God shows up? You know, God stages breakthroughs in our lives. We can't go from primary school to university in one hit. It doesn't work that way. There are stages which God wants to take us through. These stages are very important. And if we're going to go to another level, if we're going to take another volume, as it were, in understanding, waiting on God is a major key. We have to learn how to do this. It is the key. And because it is the key of taking us to the next level, we're going to have to look at this in more depth. Jeremiah 29 and verse 13, And you shall seek me, and you shall find me, when you search for me with all of your heart, and I will be found of you, saith the Lord. The last session we looked at the seeking God, the importance of seeking God, and the determination required, the three things, hunger for God is required, determination, the disciplines, the things needed, the persistence to continue with God. 
Now, in this session, we're going to look at waiting, why it is necessary uh, for us to wait. And Isaiah 30, verse 18, it says, And therefore will the Lord wait. Why? That he might be gracious unto you. And therefore will he be exalted, that he might have mercy on you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. So, blessed are they that wait for him. In other words, God doesn't want to bring us into judgment, so he waits. He waits for us. And we're going to look at this. Why would we be blessed if we have to wait for God? You know, the Bible is... A story is about getting our inheritance quickly. Prodigal son is a, a a good example of this. And the book of Proverbs it talks about the getting inheritance quickly and will not be blessed. And the prodigal son asks for his inheritance, you know, quickly. And, uh, well, we know the story. The Lord said, if I cause you to wait, the end result will be you, your blessing will be greater and uh, judgment will be less. Okay? Now, working through that and understanding that, we need to have a look at it. Uh, he makes us wait. Now, God isn't sadistic. He isn't, isn't a mean person. He doesn't make us wait unless there's a very good reason for doing that. We just simply need to understand it somewhat in order to to be able to handle that waiting period. You know, Satan, as we said, has moved. It, it, it works over time, keeping us busy. You know, and, and it's like Psalm 62 and verse 5. It says, My soul, wait thou on the Lord. Wait thou only upon God. With what? With expectation. For my expectation is from him. And it talks about they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength or mount up with wings as eagles. And so lots of scriptures deal with waiting on the Lord. Now we need to look at why we really do need to do this. Waiting on God is a process of conditioning. We said in the last session that you have to have a passport to go to the next level. And we looked at the, in the last session the degrees of consecration to the Lord. And waiting on God is a process in which God takes time to condition us. This is a key and it's really pivotal to our understanding. Because we sometimes think, well, it's such a waste of time. We wait on God for... For a long period, maybe four or five months or a year or whatever, and it seems, why couldn't God come? Why doesn't he turn up? And uh, I have a friend who he's going to be with the Lord now, but he was a missionary, and he wasn't getting very good results in his missionary work, and so he decided to wait on God. He waited on God for a whole year. Didn't do any missionary work. And um, just waited on God, and he said nothing happened for 12 months. It's nothing. One day was the same as the other. And he was spending a lot of time waiting the whole day, you know, God. He said, I'm spending all this time missionary work. I'm not getting the results. I may as well pray. That was his reasoning. So in his praying, he waited on God and sought the Lord 12 months. Now one day, no different from any other, something in eternity registered. The heavens opened. As a result of that, over a million people came to the Lord in the country in which he was a missionary. Why did God make us wait? You see, <clears throat> waiting on God is a process of conditioning. You see, there's much that God wants to give us. There's places you say, well, why didn't God take me to heaven? Why didn't God show me around heaven? Why didn't God, ha why don't I have these experiences? With some, but it's very, very, very few. These are sovereign. Mostly these are not sovereign experiences. Mostly these are the result of people who have decided they're going to find the Lord no matter what it takes. And, you know, 
There is much that God does with us while we are waiting. A conditioning takes place. And the reason for this conditioning is that to bring us to a place where we're able to receive what he wants to give us or what he wants to do with us. And um, quite often, the longer we wait, the greater the response will be in the end. Because the more time has been given for conditioning, preparing to receive. There's many, many things God wants to give us, but we can't receive them. We don't even believe in it, some of the things that he wants to give us. So there's no way in which he can give them to us unless he comes to us in revelation and understanding. And so, you know, when I first started to seriously wait on God, I was asking God for greater hearing and greater seeing ability in the spirit. And uh, I kind of reasoned out, like, particularly in spiritual warfare, we're at a, 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 a really bad advantage. When we're trying to fight an enemy, we can't hear and we can't see. Now, that, that is a real bad disadvantage in spiritual warfare. And uh, so that uh, my reasoning was come before the Lord, Lord, you know, I need to be able to see and I need to be able to hear what's going on out there. Otherwise, how can we fight an unseen enemy? And so that was my reasoning. I began to um, seek the Lord. Lord, open my eyes. I'd had a period where my eyes had been opened in the earlier years, but that closed down, and, and so I, I was praying again, seeking the Lord for opening my eyes to the level where I could see and hear clearly in the realm of the Spirit. And finally, the Lord spoke to me. And um, He spoke to me in one of those times when... You know, when you just come out of, you're coming out of sleep in the morning, you're not fully awake and you're not fully asleep. It's just in that kind of twilight zone in between. And the Lord said this, I heard clearly the words of the Lord, and he said to me, if I gave, if I give you greater spiritual sight and greater spiritual hearing, your accountability will increase greatly. I thought, oops, now I've got to rethink this. Okay, the more clearly you hear, the more accountable you are if you disobey God and what you're hearing and hearing and what he requires of you. The consequences of disobeying are far greater if your spiritual senses are more open. Now, you've got to stop and think. You're willing for that accountability. You know, accountability is a kind of frightening thing. The Bible clearly shows us that, that to whom much is given, to whom much will be required. That goes for revelation, um, the opening of our spiritual senses, the gifts of the Spirit which he, has, he, he gives to us. We are more accountable. If we disobey, the consequences are greater than if we hadn't had them in the first place. And so I thought about this, and I thought about it at great length. I thought, well, okay, am I, willing, am I ready for this? Have you ever wondered why, you know, two people can do the same thing, like in disobedience to God or sin, they can do the same thing, same action. One gets off lightly and the other doesn't. It always troubled me that. I thought, well, you know, this should be, you know, a level playing ground. How come that person got off lightly and that person didn't? And I thought, well, okay, David sins. He should have been stoned. He should have been stoned to death, but he wasn't. And I thought, well, you know, how would that sit with the people watching? The law was, you will die, stoned to death. But they did say, God said that, he was a man after his own heart. Maybe that had something to do with it. I thought of Rahab, remember Rahab? The spies came and, and, and she hid them and then the enemy came and said, have you seen the spies? And she lied and said, no, not here. And uh, so she lied about it. As a result of her lying, she was rewarded. She 
you became part of the line of Christ. I thought, strange things, you know. One guy touches the Ark of the Covenant to steady it, and he's struck dead. You know, in a court of law today, these things would be inconsistent. But with God, he looks at many things, mitigating circumstances, background. He looks at many, many, many things. And the more we receive, the more we are accountable to God. And so it's like... um, When we see things through the eyes of the Lord, it's different. Accountability is a very unusual thing and and hard sometimes to understand. So the Lord said to me, if I do this for you, you'll instantly become more accountable for disobedience. You know, God's incredibly fair. Uh, He said in, in, in Luke chapter 12 and verse 48, you know, he said, but he that knoweth not, you not and did commit things worthy of stripes, he shall be beaten with just a few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, much shall be required. And to whom men have committed much of him, they will ask the more. That's what the scripture says. So, during this time of waiting on God, he has got a lot of things to sort out with us, and it takes time. You can't say, I'm going to wait on God for a fortnight or a month and get a breakthrough. Not enough time to forgive God to sort things out in your life. So you don't think about this. Think about the kind of commitment you're making. Otherwise you're going to get halfway through it and then give it up. You know? In Luke chapter 14 and verse 26, it says this, If any man come to me and hate not his father or mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. In other words, you have to be willing to put God first. That's all the scripture is saying. God must come first in everything. You say, oh yes, I let God come first. I consecrate my life. Not quite as simple as that. You've got to start thinking about what you're saying and what this really means. Luke fourteen twenty seven. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. It's going to be cost. Verse 28, for which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counts the cost, whether he is able to finish it or not? Lest happily he lay the foundation and is not able to finish it. And behold, all mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish it. You see, you say, all right, you make a commitment, I'm going to wait on God. But there hasn't been maybe the resolve there yet. You know, be careful. You know, you've got to be able to finish this thing. See it through. What man going to war, the Bible tells us in verse 31, works out first whether he's got enough men to win the battle. If not, you better not go to war. So, as you wait on God, God says, right, we need to get some things sorted out in your life. This is the prime reason of why, you know, God asks you to wait. There are many, many things in our lives which God has to sort out. And when can God can get us to a place, there are levels which he can get us to in purification, purification of heart, and, 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 and all of those things, so that when the response does come from God, the response is greater. Now, All we see is, oh boy, the time waiting with nothing happening, seemingly because we don't see what's going on in the realm of the Spirit. And so, it's really, really important that we understand this. In fact, if we understand this, it gives us a greater motivation to continue. There are going to be times when you'll wait and wait and nothing will happen at all for a long time. You see, if God takes you into the heavenly realm, now, there must be no open doors in your life to the enemy. All open doors, or whatever they may be, have to be sorted out in the waiting period 
that gives you time to really just just sort things out. God will start to, you know, speak to your heart. You know, most times during this, God doesn't speak to you audibly or even in your heart audibly. He'll, he'll just, you'll be aware of something that is not right, something that needs to be put right in your life. When I started to do this, there were all kinds of little things which were so frustrating because to me they were just little things and didn't matter anyway. The tiny little things which I'd done previously over the past years and so on, which had to be put right. And uh, it was like, God didn't speak to the, me about these things. It was just like my conscience became aware of these things. I was aware of them through the working of my conscience. And uh, at that point, nothing would proceed past that point until I dealt with that. That's part of the waiting process, and you've got to be prepared to deal with them. And, uh, you know, when I first started waiting on God, I'd be in the middle of seeking God, and some little thing would come before me. Very frustrating. And so, waiting is something we don't like to do. But if you don't do it, you're not going to come into this level of walking with God. Because the waiting process is necessary to condition you to be able to hear and see and to be able to enter the spirit realm without harm to you. See, many people, you can come in the spirit realm and easily be deceived if there are open doors in your heart and life and you really don't want that. It can be kind of productive. The process, you see, of refining takes place, takes takes place in your response, and your response to it is critical. In other words, it's taking place in your life, this refining is taking place, and God's dealing with things. Now, if you don't deal with them when the Lord is speaking to you about it, you let it bar, then you stop the process. God might revisit that again with you and come around again and, and uh, give you another opportunity. He might do that two, three times. But if you don't deal with it, then you're stuck at that level. It doesn't go beyond that point. Because he can't, it's too dangerous for him to open those realms to you with that particular thing not dealt with. So, do you understand where I'm coming from? What the Lord is saying? He said, I've got to make you wait in order to be gracious to you. Therefore will I wait that I might be gracious to you. And so that his judgment, you see, will not be strong. Because he gives us time to come to that place. See, this wasn't at all as I thought it would be. I thought it would be wait on God, we come into his presence and things would start to happen. And it's, it wasn't like that. In fact, it, it took me a while to adjust to this process of things and even understand the process of it, why God would cause us to leave. But you see, these, these are the secrets to those men who made it into the realm of the Spirit and had to walk with God like Enoch, Moses and those guys. These were their secrets. They allowed God to deal with their hearts. Now Moses was 40 years in the wilderness until God got a lot of Egypt out of him. A lot of problems in his life were dealt with. And it took a long, long time for God to purify, you see, his soul in this whole area. And then when he finally got to that point of purification of soul, the burning bush could happen in his life as an experience, which then propelled him on into his destiny and into the next level, you see, of his walk with God. And up to that point of time, he hardly knew the voice of God if he knew it at all, but it's like he had a problem up to that point of time when God appeared to him in the burning bush. The same with all of them. Enoch. Enoch, at a certain point in his time, in his life, that caused him to walk with God and then eventually took him to the place where God was able to take him and he was translated. 
you look at Elijah, the same processes are all through his life. And you see, we so often have this doctrine, now you're born again, baptized in the Holy Spirit, everything's dealt with, you just have to believe. Then why isn't, doesn't this happen to the vast majority of Pentecostals today? Because they never wait on God. They never seek Him with their whole heart. I don't care if you speak in tongues, you prophesy and you cast out demons, you will not enter this realm until you learn how to seek God with your whole heart. And breakthroughs in this realm are successive. It takes a lot of time to get the, the space shuttle into orbit. Well, once it's into orbit, it's maintained, it's maintained without any, very little fuel required to maintain it. To get it up there is another thing. Once we get the breakthrough, we can maintain that and walk in it. Getting the breakthrough is the problem. And these breakthroughs are not, as I said before, sovereign. They only come as we are determined to find God for our own selves. Now this is your generation, and you need to find Him for your generation. You want to make an impact on this generation, you can't stay where you are. This whole generation of young people today can see through anything that's, like, not real. And you've got to have more than we've got right now in order to touch this generation. And to get it, it's going to take more than just an experience of Pentecost. You say, but the early church experienced Pentecost, and look what they did. Yes, but they had a baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. We have a baptism of the Holy Spirit and no fire. It's not there in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But it's coming. This process of God dealing with us is the fire. So it's important for us to understand that. Just because you're Pentecostal, you know, it doesn't mean that you've got it all. There is a process of finding God. If you seek for Him, you will find Him. When I talk about finding Him, I'm talking about reality, walking in a real reality with the Lord, like He not walked. Waiting. You're ready for it? You understand it? Good. It's going to take time. Let God process you as you wait on Him. 